Well, thank you for coming. Uh, let me once again welcome you. Welcome you to the sixth the, uh, launch of the Global Food Policy Report. I have seen some of your faces here for the last six years. Yeah, congratulations. Um, so this year, our report is very much focused on urbanization. And what does, does it mean to food and nutrition security? And I, I wanted to welcome uh, Luis Fresco, you know, my old friend. And she's coming from Netherlands, very far away. Other speakers are local, so I'm not going to say much about you. But uh, Luis uh, has been a pioneer, uh, uh, particularly uh, in the areas of food and nutrition security. You know, she worked at FAO before. And now she's the president of Wageningen, and the latest ranking of Wageningen Agriculture Uni Wageningen University, and the research center is number one among all agricultural universities. So congratulations. So what I'm going to do is to very briefly uh, to tell you what we have done in 2017 Global Food Policy Report. For 2016, there was a glim glimmer of hope despite all these challenges. First time in our history, the poverty rate, extreme poverty rate has come down below 10%. 10%, so rapid progress since 1990. We have also seen tremendous reduction in hunger. Right now, the percentage of hungry people is less than 11%, maybe close to 10%, if we have the latest figure. Again, that's a rapid reduction from 19% in 1990 to a little bit over 10% today. So tremendous progress. And the food prices remain very low. In fact, lowest for the last five years. When food price is very low, and many of the economists here know that poor, hungry people will benefit from that because they spent 50, 60% of their income on food. And I will not be surprised that just the food, lower food price, price in 2016 would have helped not to poor and hungry people. Yes, in 2017 or 2016, the global communities continued to move the 2030 agenda forward. Many countries begin to implement that agenda to the national level. We know that the climate change agreed in Paris have been further endorsed by many countries. So the Paris Agreement basically has been rati uh, ratified by, I think, more than 120 countries, you can correct me. And this year, uh, in November, in Marrakesh, the Africans and the global communities come together to look at African agriculture, how the African agriculture can adapt to climate change because Africa is particularly vulnerable to climate change. Three or four years ago, there was a big nutrition conference held in Rome called the Second Global Nutrition Conference. Last year, last December, the beginning of last December, again, many stakeholders came together in Rome to look at the follow-up of the ICN2, the Second Nutrition Conference. A new initiative called a decade of action was launched. So one decade of action to eliminate hunger and malnutrition so from 2016 to 2025. You might remember that IPRI has an initiative called a Compact 2025. The objective is to use our knowledge, information, data, research results to help to work with other stakeholders to eliminate hunger and malnutrition by 2025. So we are going to use this initiative also to support ICN2 follow-up. Then in 2016, urbanization has moved very high, very high. Urban agenda was development during the, uh, the third uh, Habitat Conference, or Habitat Summit. The Milan developed so-called Urban Food Policy Pact, and many countries have joined that pact. But it is still the case that we are still facing tremendous challenges when we move towards more urbanization. Looking forward to 2017, I think, yes, the political changes. We have seen political changes in 2016 already. I'm afraid we will have more changes in 2017. All these changes will have impact, fundamental impact 
on global food and nutrition security through investment, through, through um, aid, through research, and through working together, global partnership. We have heard that the famines in northern Nigeria, Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, Iranian Numi. 20 million people may suffer from famine if we don't act together. And continue the climate and the environmental changes. The climate change has happened, is happening, and it will continue to, to happen. Probably will even accelerate in the next several decades. Economic growth has been stagnant. I was in Beijing to attend a global forum. And many global stakeholders, private sector CEOs, government officials were very worried about stagnant economic growth. That, again, has an impact on global food and nutrition security. Ongoing conflicts, some of these famines you will see are very much correlated or connected uh, with the conflicts. The conflict will continue. Persistent hunger and malnutrition, it is still the case that almost 800 million people suffer from hunger. Two billion suffer from so-called micro micronutrients, hidden hunger. And on the other hand, 2 billion is suffering from overweight and obesity. Rising inequality, some of the political changes in this part of the world and in Europe or even in Africa is due to the rising inequality. I think equally important or even more important is what has happened in different regions. In Africa, agricultural growth has been accelerating, partly because of the CADA company has comprehensive African agriculture development program. However, that growth, agriculture growth, has trickled down, well, not as fast as um, in, in reducing hunger and malnutrition. You know, in many other parts of the world, when agriculture is growing, poverty is going down, malnutrition is going down. In Africa, it's happening, but not as fast as others. Drought, yeah, drought in eastern, southern Africa, South Asia, we have seen some positive news. The countries begin to develop policies to diversify their production, food production away from rice, wheat, and maize, to include vegetables, fruits, dairy production. But it's still the case that the, the subcontinent suffers the child stunting more than any other continent, other region. East Asia, if you go to East Asia, the top priority you hear from the government officials is food safety. The recent Brazil meat scandal added to the complexity to the issue. Central Asia, we have seen more integration of that region to east and west, west to Europe, east to China. And we have seen foreign direct investment coming, coming to the region. Middle East continue to suffer from conflicts. On the other hand, overweight obesity begin to rise. And not in America, I think the most important trend there is increasing overweight and obesity. Yeah, El Nino was a big thing in affecting different parts of the world in 2016, Southern Africa, um, even parts of Asia, and uh, many parts of Latin America. So urbanization, yes, is in spotlight or on the spotlight in 2016, will continue to be on the spotlight in 2017. So the report has several chapters focusing on urban hunger and malnutrition, you know, two dimensions of many burdens of malnutrition. And nutrition transition, just in a decade or two, many emerging economies transited from undernutrition to overnutrition, particularly in the urban centers. The value chains, how the value chains links many smallholders to more affluent urban consumers informal markets, particularly governance issues. And obviously, we also have regional chapters, regional uh, developments to cover the major policy changes in different regions. And one of the uh, important elements of the report is every year we track, monitor certain many indicators that are highly relevant to global food and nutrition security, agricultural research investment, agricultural investment, policy-making capacity, hunger index, agriculture productivity growth, 
and beyond. So this shows you how urbanization has happened very quickly. So around 1990, at that time, the world only has like 2.3 billion urban residents. Today is 4 billion. Could you imagine such a rapid growth? And uh, from now to 2050, the urban population will continue to, to grow even faster than the past trend. So right now, it's about half. Half of the population is urban areas. By 2050, there will be two thirds. The challenge is in urban hunger and malnutrition. The burden of malnutrition are shifting to urban areas. So very quickly, very soon, we'll realize that it's not just the rural areas, it's urban areas where we will face triple burden of malnutrition. Unnutrition, you know, undernourishment, lack of micronutrients, overweight and obesity. And urban food face unique challenges. They are very different from rural challenges. The dependent, the dependent, they are dependent on the informal sector. They're very vulnerable to income and price shocks because they don't have to do their own food. They have very limited access to basic services, you know, sanitation, clean drinking water. And we are struggling with the data. You know, the data we have today is very ad hoc. There is no comprehensive survey of hunger, malnutrition, food security in urban areas. Diets are changing. Now, diets change first, and then nutrition changes. So nutrition transition is on the way from you know, the to a higher consumption of, of animal source foods, sugar, fats, and oils, refined grains, and processed foods. Overweight obesity and other diet-related diseases are rising because of the diet problem. Then urban food environments pose challenges and opportunities as well. So not just a uh, challenges, but also opportunities. I will come back to that a little bit later. Urban growth is reshaping agriculture value chains. So value chains are changing. They're even stable foods, even rice, wheat, and maize. That value chain has been reshaped. Vegetables, fruits, dairy production, probably more so. And there is a so-called quiet revolution. So revolution is going, is going on, but you just cannot observe it's going on there. You know, the use of my mobile phone, great vertical uh, integration of the whole value chain, and a, a increased investment in technology, modern inputs, and particularly in the whole processing, transporting, retailing sector. However, today our agriculture policy and food policy is still very much focused on production. And in the future, we must change that direction. We also look at the, the missing middle. Part. Now, governance, so I'm not going to talk much. Daniel uh, will talk about this. But one of the concerns I have is there is no coherent policy between rural and urban areas. Okay, there may be a food security policy in rural areas. Maybe there is a nutrition policy in urban areas. Can we really coordinate these two policies together? And I have been traveling Africa. I observe that in some of the urban centers, the consumers consume imported foods, imported rice from Thailand and Vietnam, wheat from Middle East, from, from uh, Central Europe. But in the meantime, just 10, 20 kilometers away, smallholders cannot, cannot access to that market. So that value chain is broken. Now, the, the highlight of this report is rural, rural urban linkages. So I, I was fortunate enough to co-author a chapter together with FLDG, uh, I think FL representative is here, to look at the opportunities to link rural areas and the urban sectors together, to come up with win-win strategy solutions. And if we do that, we will help to achieve multiple goals of sustainable development, SDGs. So you will see that you know, if we invest in processing storage facilities in the middle part, we will help to reduce food waste, food loss, increase food diversity. And if we can improve the coordination and planning between urban and rural areas, then we have more labor and market opportunities for smallholders, and then use management and improve food security for all, for urban areas. And most important, or probably equally important, is intermediate small cities. We have ignored the role of intermediate 
or small cities in the rural, in linking rural areas to urban areas. So there are many recommendations in the report, overall, over, from the overall report. Improve policy coordination between rural and urban areas. Support efficient, inclusive rural urban value chains. So smallholders, women, youth must be part of that value chain. And in average towns and intermediate cities to facilitate economic and social links. So when you invest, don't forget small and medium-sized cities. Improve targeting of public investment. We know that infrastructure investment, electricity, roads is, uh, are essential in helping linking rural and urban areas and promote social protection in both rural and urban areas. We know that in rural and urban areas, there will, be, there will continue to be poor and hungry people. We must use social protection to help them. And I treat urbanization as opportunity. How can we, be, we seize this opportunity to improve well-being, to eliminate hunger and malnutrition in both and rural and urban areas? So we want to hear from you. Thank you very much.